um, you know that you have a special occasion when your nine-year-old son tells you the day before an event to make sure you get a selfie with the most famous artist <laughs> in the world. His words, direct, uh, direct um, quotation. Um, of course, Ai Weiwei is not here for his fame today, but for his work. And we are really excited to be discussing this. My colleague, an art historian, uh, Dorothea van Hantelmann, is going to give a, a quick introduction in those most relevant terms to Ai Weiwei uh, in just a second. I would like to start on a related note. Um, I think it is a related note for why Bard College Berlin is such a good and fitting place for a discussion with you, Professor Ai. Um, most of you know that we are very small. We have about 350 students, but there are from about 60, 70 uh, different countries. And this means that we have uh, very broad, wide-ranging, and sometimes difficult discussions in the college. Uh, we have uh, many students, about 16% of our students are uh, on scholarships for young people who have been displaced by war or political oppression, and uh, many of them from Afghanistan, from Ukraine, very different places, Syria as well. We also, of course, compared to the city around us, to the country around us, have a lot of uh, students who are Muslim, who are Jewish, students who are from Palestine, students are from, from Israel. And you can imagine that we've had, both in the classroom and outside, both with faculty and students amongst themselves, um, difficult, hard discussions here. You may know that the, the, the Latin root for diversity, diversitas, actually connotes very strongly uh, discord. Of course, now di diversity has a positive connotation, and it does so here. But that discord, I think, is very important. Discord, at least in the sense of having these hard conversations. Why are they hard? Because people do not enter them with the same histories. People do not enter them with the same uh, prejudices or even knowledge about different parts of the world. And I think, uh, Professor I, if, if I may say that, and of course you can contradict me, has spoken out both in words and perhaps more importantly in works about what I would say is the fact that conformity, narrowness in discourse is not something that only happens in oppressive political regimes. It can happen in any society, and I think uh, recently we've seen a bit of a narrowing of discourse. And Bard College Berlin is one of the places in Berlin, in Germany, that really has the people there and has the voices there that can broaden this discourse and that can help us against the dangers of narrowness and perhaps sharing too much of a consensus on some things, a consensus that is sometimes in danger of blocking out voices, histories, and facts, indeed, from parts of the world that we're not so familiar with. So I think it's very nice that um, we can, can have this conversation here today. Uh, before I pass um, the, the, the torch to Dorothea, as it were, I would like to thank a few people for making this possible. First and foremost, uh, Eva Atanasov and our student, uh, ex-student, our alumni, uh, Kazimir Lehnherr without whom these, uh, th this uh, event would not have taken place, uh, for initiating, initiating it and, and conceiving of it. And then also to a number of calls, colleagues in the college, like uh, Chelsea Anderson-Long, uh, Kerry Bystrom, Berit Ebert, who's in the audience, Bendetta Wu, and Mohamed Ali Godz, who's helping us today, as well as our student assistant, Michelle Jovanovska and Mathilde Traoré de la Vigne, who you will meet afterwards. You saw there will be uh, an occasion for, for drinks uh, afterwards. Support 
for this event comes from the uh, Mellon Foundation. A small part comes from the Mellon Foundation, which supports the Consortium on Forced Migration, Displacement, and Education, of which Bard College Berlin is a part. And also part of the funding for today comes from the Open Society University Network, of which Bard College Berlin is a very proud and I think the most important member. Um, before I go to Dorothea, I also wanted to just briefly mention the fact, very important to us, that we are just starting this semester. We have started a new degree program that's integrated with the other one, but whose focus and indeed name is Practicing Arts and Society. And that program, I think, uh, does uh, a lot of what I've just described more generally in and with respect to the arts, really seeing the arts as one resource, as one discourse or a number of discourses that function through all senses that are cognitive but also sensory, that are related to the body and that can help us think through difficult and big questions while also be cognizant, being cognizant of the, the, the histories that go into <clears throat> making that art and the great art of the past, and that should, of course, also inform the art making in the future. So that is our endeavor, and it's very nice to have uh, in the first year, in fact, the first semester of this program, our guest here, uh, Mr. Ai Weiwei. <laughs> Yes, um, hello everyone. It is a, a pleasure and a great honor uh, for me to introduce our guest, Ai Weiwei. Thank you very much for coming, uh, who without any doubt uh, does not need much of an introduction, so I'll keep myself short. A conceptual artist whose practices include sculpture, sculptural installation, filmmaking, photography, ceramics, painting, writing, architecture, performance, and social media, Ai Weiwei's work fuses traditional craftsmanship with a variety of formal languages to reflect on the contemporary geopolitical and sociopolitical condition. His work has, exhibited, uh, has been exhibited extensively at institutions and biennials worldwide. We all know that. But it's still important to mention, from his legendary contribution to Documenta 12 in 2007, to his large-scale installation at Tate Modern's Turbine Hall in 2010. In 2013, his work was shown at the German Pavilion in the Venice Biennale, followed by a retrospective at Berlin's Gropiusbau in 2014, and in the following years, large-scale exhibitions in Israel, uh, Brazil, Portugal, the USA, Australia, and, and Great Britain, among many other countries. Ai Weiwei has received numerous awards and honors, among them the Lifetime Achievement Award from the Chinese Contemporary Art Awards in 2008. His human rights work has been recognized through the Vaclav Havel Prize for Creative Descent in 2012 and Amnesty International's Ambassador of Conscience Award in 2015. In 2021, the artist memoir, 1,000 Years of Joys and Sorrows, was published. It's great to see this place so full, uh, <laughs> to be honest. It's a real pleasure. To me, as an art historian, Ai Weiwei is one of the few artists who really manages to operate in various fields, who, as an artist, effectively reaches beyond the field of art. Through his work as an activist and publicist, through his operations with social media and his reactions to current events, ranging from comments on a trip to China by, by the German Chancellor Olaf Scholz in 2022 to publishing his ver video version of Gangnam Style in 2012. In particular, I want to mention his 15-year-long exchange with the architects Herzog and Dimoron with whom he collaborated on projects such as the Bird's Nest Stadium for the Beijing Olympic Games in 2008 and the 2012 Pavilion for the Serpentine Gallery in London. Way more than an artist, Ai Weiwei is a human rights advocate, a public intellectual from the field of art. 
an overall producer of meaning, so to speak, for whom these modern distinctions between art, architecture, politics, and activism might be of little or no relevance. Someone who, in connecting all these fields, very much embodies the spirit of our arts program and in many ways also the mission of our college. Today, I will be, will be in conversation with Eva Atanasov, who is professor of politics at Bard College Berlin and who is teaching and research explores how key modern concepts such as sovereignty, democracy, modernity, have been understood and deployed in different cultural and ideological contexts. Eva is the author of Tocqueville's Dilemma and Our Sovereignty, Nationalism, Globalization from 2022, and most recently the co-editor of When the People Rule, Popular Sovereignty in Theory and Practice from 2023. Jeff Lehman, is an art historian of the Italian Renaissance, whose research interests include the theory and history of perspective, landscape painting, and the phenomenology of art and, and, and art. A passionate educator, Jeff's teaching focuses on the direct encounter with art and the experiences, interpretive insights, and love that it can inspire. Jeff is the co-author of The Parthenon and Liberal Education from 2019, and of articles on Bruegel, Titian, and Leonardo da Vinci on others. Gao Jiao, or Lilith, <laughs> is a fourth year student at BCB, double majoring in ethics and politics, art and aesthetics. She's currently at work on her BA thesis, which examines Xu Bing's attempt to create a universal language with art. Lilith has worked as an assistant curator at the Jupiter Museum of Art and, of art and, and Duang Research Academy, as well as a student researcher at the Palace Museum in Beijing and the Henan Museum. Thank you very much for being here, Ai Weiwei, and I hand over to Eva to start. Thank you, Dorothea, for the generous introduction, which, however, did not include you. So, Dorothea von Hantelmann, our uh, director of the new Science and uh, Art and Society program and curator and art historian herself. That, um, thank you for I'm Jennifer at the IYB studio. I forgot to ask. Yeah, <laughs> we wanted to, ask, to thank the studio as well, especially Jennifer for, for helping us. Um, put together this uh, this morning, this, this encounter. First of all, and most of all, I'd like to um, thank IYWA for giving us one in a lifetime opportunity to talk about your work and art in general here in this intimate setting. Um, we, uh, I'll say just a few words how we're going to proceed and then uh, hand it over to Jeff. So we are going to have or that was our pitch, we would like to have a relaxed conversation about uh, most immediately the exhibition just, that just opened in September called Know Thyself, uh, which has a very resonant title and we'll, we'll run with that for a while, but also more generally about art and what your view is uh, about the role of art in society and maybe more generally about existential human themes. Um, a few uh, formal or kind of procedural things. We agreed to address each other by first name. We are a very egalitarian place here and we would like to uphold our customs for the next uh, 80 minutes or so. We'll have um, a, a panel conversation and exchange uh, which we hope will be a kind of spontaneous combustion for about uh, 30 to 40 minutes and then we'll invite you uh, uh, dear audience, thank you for being here to pose a question as well around noon. Um, and now with this, I hand it over to Jeff to ask the first set of questions, maybe. Yes. Yeah, so one, one more small introduction. I know everyone is eager to hear Wei Wei speak, so I will, and to get our conversation going, so I will be um, relatively brief, but I did want to introduce everyone to um, one of the works in the exhibition as a sort of um, inspiration, jumping off point for a larger question about art. So, yeah, so this is this the exhibition. You can come back to this. Um, oh, wrong one. <laughs> Let's see. Ah, 
There we go. So this this was my this was my favorite from the exhibition, the Monet um, Water Lilies number two, um, which is an immersive experience that I, if you haven't been to this exhibition, know thyself, um, I strongly recommend because these artworks are very powerful in person. And this one on three walls, you enter a room and it surrounds you and very much in the spirit of, oh, one question, of the painting of, one of the many paintings of, Mo of Water Lilies Monet did in his last couple of decades of his life, this one in New York in the, oh, yeah. <laughs> this one in New York in the in the MoMA. Um and I which you can probably see from this comparison is the that Weiwei has recreated the work <coughs> in a new medium. So I want to maybe show them what you have done here a bit up more up close. If you get close to this work, it changes <coughs> quite dramatically when you realize it's made of uh, Lego bricks. And this is a toy I played with as a child, so I was very happy to see this. Um, and I think beyond, I mean, whether or not, uh, you know, you have experience with Legos, it's, it's, a, it's, it's a quite a different medium than oil paint. So the first, maybe the, 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 the question I want to get to has to do with um, subversion of expectations. And I know I'm not the first person to talk about subversiveness with your art, but the maybe I want to reflect it in a certain way has has to do with the the different ways the artwork can kind of invert or change based on um, its its uh, different layers. So here, something that is from let's say has associations from outside of art has is sort of brought in as the medium becomes a kind of like a module for building the, the artwork. And I think of some others of your works from earlier. Well, first, here's a here's detail. So you can see this is actually made of thousands and thousands of Lego bricks that have been put together to recreate the painting as a kind of wall sculpture. So this one from 2009, um, this would be worth discussing because it has very, uh, a very, um, broad uh, political context, but the, the, shortly there was an earthquake in, in um, Sichuan in 2008, I think, right? and this is, a, this is a work that's in tribute to that, and here, if you, from a distance you look, you see uh, a kind of banner with a sentence, which is uh, spoken by one of the parents actually involved in the collapse of the school, but if you get closer, and I don't have the detail, but if you get closer, you'll see that this work is all made of children's backpacks. So, Again, at the level of the physical making of the work, some new dimension opens up, which I think maybe challenges thought in a new direction. The use of all of these backpacks to make a picture. Or um, this one, which was installed in Berlin. Um, and correct me if I've got this wrong, but I believe so. this was made of doors from demolished old houses that were replaced by new construction. And then it itself collapsed in the wet Berlin Do weather. Documenta. Documenta. Oh, this is, this is Documenta. I do. Okay, thank you. This was in Castle. Mm -hmm. And uh, again, a work made out of objects that have a connection to something beyond that, again, sort of su surprisingly brings in something maybe that you would not expect in a sculpture. Um, and then. The last point I will get to, and then, and then this is where you can maybe respond um, in any way you would like. There is a anomaly, for me an anomaly, knowing the Monet very well, which is that in one corner of this um, re, let's say, recreation of the Monet water release is this dark area, which the gallery tells me evokes <laughs> the um, underground dwelling where you lived with your father in exile. Oh, and there's the photograph. Well, wow. okay, it didn't have it. I see. It doesn't just evoke, it really looks like it. Yeah. So, here, and if I could put this briefly, this work in its own way, I think, creates this sort of envi almost dreamlike environment in which there's a kind of shimmering surface. There's no, um, no ordinary sense of depth. It's, it's, um, almost like a hallucinatory experience, and then you get this 
interruption, this dark interruption, which I think shapes the character of the work. Um, it, changed, it not only interrupts, but it sort of opens up a space, a dark space in this spaceless place. So even not knowing this is obviously very important personal and historical connection, there's a sense of something being subverted, reoriented, undermined, the serenity maybe of this space. And um, just with one last, like, I, I can't resist because I don't know if all of you have seen works, these works of, of Weiwei's, but uh, Forever Bicycles um, from 2003, where the, uh, the, here it's made of something that would normally be moving, that you would use outside of the context of art for motion, now it's fixed into a still sculpture, so again, a kind of inversion of, I keep pushing the wrong button, um, or these, where motion seems to be introduced in a different way, but not the way a bicycle would travel. So, and maybe I'll skip that for now. Maybe, so my question would be, um, not about the Monet particularly, but about your work in general, the sense of like um, inverting or subverting uh, expectations of viewers. Do you think this is an important part of your work? Is this something you value? And maybe for art in general, is this something you would consider an important aspect of art? Thank you uh, for this uh, introduction of a few works. Can you hear me? <clears throat> okay. Um, yes, I'm, I'm an artist or sort of an artist, and uh, I have to do a work with uh, a reason. Yeah, it's just simply why why you uh, make a work or uh, for quite some time in my life I I don't make work. So I spent about twelve years in New York. I made a few works there. I don't see this necessity for me to to work because there's a lot of artists and uh, as a Chinese migrants uh, students there, I don't even feel I have a chance to to fully express myself. So <coughs> after that, I went back to China after twelve years. I went back to China because I I found an excuse for me to go back because I decided never go back. Uh, when I left China 12 years ago, uh, I mean in 1981. So by 93, I went back because my father was in hospital. I said, okay, this is the last chance. So I said, you know, I go back to, to see my father. But the, the real reason is I don't feel my life serve any purpose in New York. And I just hanging around, you know, I don't, I don't really know how, what to do, you know, I, I want to be an artist, but uh, certainly they don't need another Chinese guy there. And uh, so I just hang around for, for too long, 12 years. Lower East Side, also living in a basement. <laughs> uh, 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 Indian landlord, I still remember that. And uh, Let's talk about the, this particular, particular work of uh, Monet. Uh, why do a Monet? You know, so my father studied in Paris in nineteen late nineteen twenties or early thirties as an artist, and uh, for three years, of course, that time. When he mentioned that time, he's already not allowed to do anything in uh, writing or doing art. He was uh, living as an exiled writer. You know. So he told me the story is, once in Paris, his one of his artworks being selected by uh, some kind of independent salon, which is really uh, created by Monet. So he's very proud of it. Uh, because Monet at that time is not a, a mainstream artist, uh, still, you know, the, the, the classic salon would not include him even. So he, he creates this uh, in, independent salon. So when I hear that we are living <coughs> in this, uh, the image I showed you, oh, you couldn't see it. It's, it's something underground, it's, mm -hmm. it's a dugout. It's really almost like when Saddam Hussein being pulled out by the U.S. Army. 
that kind of condition to remember the image. So we spent about five years underground. Like, you know, he was punished to clean the public toilets. And uh, then I heard about Monet. So, you know, <laughs> it was funny. And uh, later, of course, I have been recognized as, as artist again. And uh, finally, I find a, a material, a language, a Lego or, or child toys, so I can use. Because I, I gave up painting when I was in New York. I don't like the act of painting, you know, brushes or oil pens or I, I don't like that. I, I want to be a little bit detached. So I don't want the, the strokes uh, emo shows my emotions or my energy or passion. This, I think that really belongs to the old time. I'm a bit influenced by Marcel Duchamp, you know, she, she is very detached and uh, always trying to find a new language. So. But I couldn't find it till very late, uh, 2014, when I was in detention. I have to do a show in Alcatraz. It's a, you know, it's a, a jail in California. I think I have an image of this. Oh yeah. Can keep talking. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. This mm -hmm. one. It's a. It's a abandoned uh, federal jail for the the worst people. So the show are dedicated to freedom. So uh, the title of the show is At Large, you know, because uh, this <coughs> famous uh, prisoner get escaped from mm. the, there. So there have been made movies about Alcatraz. So I decided to do 175 political prisoners, the mm. image. Uh, on the ground, because the prison have uh, their own principle, you cannot touch, you cannot hang in anything. You know, it's, it's like a landmark building. So I said, what am I going to do? So I said, uh, I can use this uh, flower uh, in this factory. Mm -hmm. So I, I suddenly I think about use Lego, because all those images of political prisoners, they are not in the equal quality. They are, some are just so blurred. And uh, you know, it's not a, a portrait. It's a really a bad image. Sometimes, like uh, I, I remember a lady from uh, North Korea. Korea. It's nothing here, but you see some Tibetans, the poet, and uh, people from everywhere, include uh, everywhere globally. Iran or Russian, but still also include a few from the United States, like uh, Snowden or Chelsea Manning, and uh, you know uh, a few people. So I, I have a, I have to challenge. How do I make those image looks equally good? You know, because some are very fresh, <coughs> some are very fine image. Suddenly, I think Lego kind of helped me that to make the pixels have great definition, and I also <coughs> can manipulate easily with uh, their culture background. You know, the color reflect their culture, the Russians or or Africans, <coughs> different nation. So it come out. Uh, it was very successful because uh, I. Since I was in soft detention, I, I often always not sure if the work can be delivered because of what happens if they stop me mm -hmm. to shaking work out. So I designed Legos. Let's California. The my, you know my my colleagues there to to put Legos together, which is easy and uh, exactly same quality as I designed. So that that's how the Lego being picked up by me, and I later found out it's uh, very useful. Then come back to the Monet, and uh, mm -hmm. I like to do a work about Monet, and, uh, but at the same time, to put my father's experience, my experience in relate to the work, 
So all the work I, I do is have mm -hmm. some stories or some twists about my personal stories. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. sorry, it's long, but you know. No, it's, yeah, a, a couple of maybe quick follow up comments, and that's of course we worked this, and I know there are other questions. Um, when you say the connection to Deschamps, do you feel inspired by his work? It strikes me that in a way you're making art out of ready-mades, right? The backpacks <coughs> of the children, the doors that were already sure. parts of other houses, and the Legos, which are you know, mass-produced. So, but it's for me, it's very different than Duchamp because it's not the ready-made per se. It's like the ready-made as the starting point for building something that is very di different, actually, especially like when you talk about the the images at Alcatraz. It, I don't know if you know if this was in the back of your mind, but Legos are a toy that you 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 build on the ground, right? So to have to work on the ground, it's sort of natural to um, use something like this, perhaps, but then when you put it on the wall, it's very unexpected. And so for the Monet, it's interesting because you can get close, you have the sense of the Legos, but from a distance it sort of turns into something something else, which I think is not, which is not the ready-made anymore, but some, something more... Um, you're right, it's not mm -hmm. ready-made, but I often say, uh, you know, when Duchamp feels Ready made, he 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 really paid attention to the very ordinary objects which mm -hmm. already have a fixed meaning of the mm. practical right. usage, you know, like a wheel or a stool or whatever. Mm. And uh, I I also at the beginning I did works like that. It's like a classic Chinese table or you know mm. things like that. But later I think I take a China as ready-made, mm. or, or culture as ready-made, mm. you know, or aesthetic uh, fixed judgment as a, about the values. So they all can be ready-made for me. So mm -hmm. give me much bigger space to to work on my my condition. So can I ask one more follow-up, mm -hmm. especially about the Alcatraz? You kept saying I was in detention. And that's on another ironic dimension to that show. Maybe you could tell us a little bit more why were you in detention? How did you manage to put a work while in detention? Well, I, wa I was in soft detention. I was mm -hmm. uh, in detention twice, but, uh, uh, but only last for what, 81 days. And... Uh, yeah, the question why it really should answer by the one detains me because I still don't cannot figure out why they detain me and also why they release me. You know the book. I think it's very interesting about uh, this kind of society is they they never give you a clear reason. They always tell you you know why. <coughs> So I, I think that is uh, interesting, you know, they, they would tell you, you know why. And so that, that make you become a part of it because you're part of the game, you have to imagine. So I would say I must be something so hateful and they have to do this for a powerful state or they, they decide. It's not an easy decision just to some, make someone disappear. Like me, it was already quite a very, you know, publicized person. You know, it's just secretly taking me from the airport and put the black hole on my face and deliver it to somewhere nobody knows where. Even even the soldiers accompany me all the time, 24 hours a day. They don't even know where they are. Mm -hmm. Even when they get into army, they they were being secretly sent to that location. Till two or three years later, they they are not they are dismissed to their, their position. They're being secretly sending out, so they don't know what exactly the location is. They only know it's in Beijing. They served in Beijing, so. Uh, but I only can guess 
whoever made the decision have a perfect argument, I have to be detained. That's all I, I know, because I've never been officially charged. They never put me in court. They, they even refused to say I was detained. They would say, you're under house, uh, how do you say? Arrest. House, house arrest? Yeah, it's not a, a yeah, it's, you're fixed into your house, something like that. So house arrest, maybe. But it's not really house arrest, it's a, it's a separate detention. That's even. If I think that relates to the the Monet you made as well, in that that's this <coughs> dark, this dark cavernous opening. Like this is the place where people are made to disappear, or maybe experience the work as a place in which you're lost. Or escape. It's very powerful, given your own personal history and experiences. Uh, yes, uh, come back to the history. I think uh, in history or political history or art history, even family history. There's always something unex unexplainable. It's unspeakable. It's always black hole somewhere, you know. Mm. So, yeah, that's how I feel. I write my memo. One reason because when my father was alive, I never even asked him a question. I really feel so bad because so close to me, but why I never ask a, a question so mm -hmm. he can answer me? So it's just like that. <laughs> yeah, for me, I was like wondering if if this work has something to do with like your child. Make louder. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> so, so like the question regarding this artwork I want to ask is, is that. <coughs> Is this kind of like a black hole has something related to your childhood memory with your father? Because like according to something I read before, it's like it has something to do with like the the time you lived with your father in Xinjiang, if I remember it correctly. Yeah, it's exactly. I'm talking about uh, my experience with uh, my father. He as a poet and was punished because he's. He had his own, he's not even anti-revolution, he's part of the revolution. He inspired, you know, the, the, the leaders for generations read his poetry, become revolutionary fighters or something. But he is, of course, punished as a, uh, called the rightist, but rather a, a dissident. And uh, yeah, it's my relations to him and my relations to contemporary art or a new language. You know, I have to find a language, so basically. Lilith, yeah, we were talking before about the Last Supper. Yeah. You know, if you wanted to. I'd love to, but I have to find her. You want the one to change the slot? Uh, yeah. <laughs> So this is like the one I wanted to ask questions about. Um, these are like actually three <coughs> different works called The Lost Supper in Green, The Lost Supper in White, and The Lost Supper in Pink. And so for me, I wanted I, I, I saw this one detail that is like different from the the original work, which you actually replaced the figure of Judas with your own self portrait. Uh -huh. um, I want to show you, like the audience like a detail. So basically here, um, we replaced Judas with his own picture, <laughs> and I was wondering... I used to have a dark beard. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, yeah, when you were... picture from yeah. 20 years ago. Yeah. Oh, and, and so like for me, I was wondering like, because um, Judas is like probably the most famous figure for uh, betraying Jesus in Western culture, and as you already said that you treat culture or like this um, artworks that already exist as like a ready-made. So I wonder like why would you choose to act as Judas in mm -hmm. this recreation and like what or who is the Jesus that you are betraying in this one? Well, uh, there are also different layers and uh, 
My father wrote a poetry about uh, a single poem about uh, the death of Jesus. So uh, also leave me a very strong impression that and he quoted uh, uh, one sentence from Bible that the one seeds if it's not uh, dead in the ground it will remain as one but once the seed dead it will grow many many uh, seeds I mean that's not good translation but you know so it's very much like a, a Ukrainian lady told the Russian soldiers that the uh, you know, you better put some sunflowers in your pocket so next year some sunflowers can come up. So this kind of thing, it describes the event or it describes a, a political situation always leave very strong mark on our mind because we, we all understand the human emotions and the details, you know, the, the the charming part of the details. So my father explained to me uh, in his poems about the Judas is he when he see someone someone washes uh, Jesus uh, Jesus washes a poor guy's feet with this kind of liquid. So he he made a comment said that liquid can is expensive can give to the poor. Something like that. So then later, for the money, he kind of betrayed. I'm not a, a someone have a rich background in in Bible, but uh, those stories leave some impression on me. And of course, this is a, a very iconic image about this Last Supper, but. Uh, also, for me, it's more iconic because Andy Warhol did uh, his last pen. Well, it's not really painting; it's a silk screen. On on this, that's based actually. My Lego is ba not based on the original, but rather based on Andy Warhol's work. So I like those kind of layers in there. You know, why Warhol has to do this? They said of work uh, before he, of course, he doesn't know he's going to die. He did also accidentally, <coughs> but that was the moment I was in New York. So while doing this work, I thought uh, I have to put myself in there to make me feel it's worth doing it. So the person I choose is uh, do this because he's the only person I feel has some characters. And, uh, yeah, yeah he, 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 he needs some money and he exchanges the ideology for the money, which is very understandable. Thank you. Can I pick up? Yeah, yeah, of course. I would like to come back to the title of your exhibit, which is also, as we put in the description, uh, something very close to our heart here, that is n Know Thyself, right? Know Thyself comes, and maybe you can tell us a little bit more why you came up with that particular title, but it, but it is the, the inscription that used to exist in the Temple of Apollo in, um, in Delphi, uh, at Delphi, which I guess no longer exists, but we've heard from it. The reason we know about it is because it became associated uh, again, by no accident, but by a famous writer, Plato, with uh, with Socrates, right? With the with the Socratic mission to go through life in an examined way, to examine your way, and to think about uh, who you are and what are you up to, and why, as you said, you didn't want to make art in New York because because it didn't make sense. You you didn't see the purpose. So why make art? And, and it seems to me, for me, that exhibit was, or exhibition was um, perhaps a way to study your answer to the question, why make art? And how do you go through this process of self-knowledge? And that's a one dimension, the, as you said, the autobiographical. But there is another dimension to the exhibit, which I would call, I don't know, oracular, <laughs> or maybe prophetic, right? Where you stand in the space of the oracle, and say, you people out there, know thyself, 
or you Western culture, because that's the challenge here, you know thyself. Um, you should examine who you are or what, what you're up to. It's also interesting that you should put yourself in the character of Judas. That is, uh, that is uh, subversive, right? That is, um, that is perhaps ironic uh, or satirical, but it... it doubly so, because we have Warhol subverting and then... But at the same I time, mean, theologically, I think that's profound. Because, you know, yes, Judas exchanged the promise of salvation uh, for the 30 silver coins, right? For the 30 pieces of silver. silver he was the silver. silver, <laughs> interestingly, silver. Um, and he was a proto-capitalist, you know, monetized uh, a promise. But, but in that very gender, a gesture, right, he actually made salvation possible. Because without him, Jesus would not be on the cross. And without the crucifixion, there would be no resurrection. So I was thinking actually about this, this theme that maybe is not immediately present in the exhibit, but it seems to be all about salvation, this piece. Uh, it, it, am I on the wrong track? Maybe too many questions. absolutely on the right track, but uh, still I'm very confused, even just saying know yourself or... Uh, but I think it's uh, it's, uh, it's something you can ask all time because we, we, I think even at the last moment of our life, if we we can see that or we know what is the purpose or functioning of uh, of life, I think that is uh, uh, maybe that's why why Romans when they have a huge banquet they would put the skeletons on the table and, uh, to 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 always uh, as uh, some kind of reminder of uh, of life so mm -hmm. of course uh, it, it, uh, it's always related to uh, our modern life it doesn't matter we celebrate it or we are we're, or feel desperate about it or we are so relaxed or comfortable about this. Still that question is, remains so valid. So, yeah. If I can maybe... Yeah, Let me just yeah, quickly for the benefit ahead. of the audience I wanted yeah. to mention. This is the original Roman mosaic found on the Appian Way, <laughs> on with the Greek you inscription. You see, they reversed it. Yes, <laughs> and that is exactly the comment I wanted to make. A little, well, I would uh, go back to Ava's question, but but you did reverse it, which does suggest something either ironic or maybe mirroring. Uh, if I don't reverse it, they they will think it too easy. So, <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I w they will say, where's the creativity? Mm -hmm. But the reverse is a big career. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, that's, that's, that's true. Thank you for finding the original. Well, that's as if the, the inscription of thyself is written so the skeleton can read it. Mm -hmm. Well, it's interesting because it's Roman with the Greek inscription. And I also thought the Lego was uniquely suitable for a mosaic, right? It was a modern version <laughs> yeah. of that ancient mosaic. So it seemed the to be... In a way, the Lego yeah. is connect mosaic and uh, our pixels in digital age. You know, we all facing the computers, iPhone, everything is a is a pixel. So it's strange. You know? it, it, it takes two thousand years to to come back to the very essential dots. It's very much related to why did the sound parcels or you know all those uh, pixels. So. Mm -hmm. Do we have time for one more version of? I think so, and I'm yeah. just gonna. Yeah. I, I since you mentioned the sunflower seeds, I will put them up. That's an amazing work. If I understand correctly, you took you oh, yeah. had ten yeah. million. Yeah. Is it ten million or one hundred million? Uh, porcelain. One hundred million. One hundred million porcelain, handmade porcelain imitations of sunflower seeds, handmade and hand-painted, incredible amount of work, filling, I think this is what Dorothea was referring to in 2010, filling the Tate Modern, uh, so this is the one you're referring to, I see. Yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's kind of crazy, mad work, mm -hmm. and this kind of work, no, not me or anybody else can repeat it, you know, because it happens.
why this happens. But the, yeah. Just, but you didn't make all, all, all the millions yourself. I tried to make a few. It doesn't reach the quality because it's all made by the people who use their lifetime as a, as a craftsman uh, in porcelains. They are housewives. They bring back to their home to make it. You know, it's 1,600 of a, mostly women. And uh, it yeah, take about two years to, to make it from different households. It's the most beautiful thing about it is not industrially made, it's really manually made and by the people I love, you know, the ordinary people, but they are craftsmen, so it's very interesting. So. So if I can go back to the question of salvation again. So you said you were in New York for 12 years at large, not finding purpose in making art. And, and you needed to go back to China I don't to need find to go that back to China. No, I, I, never, I never had a, how do you say, a goal to find a purpose. I just feel my life doesn't serve a purpose, mm -hmm. but I never think I will find a, a purpose. Mm. But it seems like, at least in the spirit of the exhibition, that you do seem to think art does serve a purpose, and that is the purpose of exhorting us, first of all, the purpose of find, helping you find who you are, right? So art making as a form of self-knowledge or self-discovery. Uh, uh, help me to confuse myself. <laughs> I'm more confused than ever, you know, so I'm a person, I just ask my you know, studio, we have people doing uh, archives. I, actually, she's sitting, uh, sitting over there. She just texts, uh, messaged me. I said, how many shows I did? So she texted me 200 one-person shows. I was shocked, you know, 200 one-person shows. And uh, all together, 700 exhibitions, I think, anticipate. But I started very late, actually. After 2004 or five, mm -hmm. I started my regular shows. But before in New York, I only had one show. So, yeah, I really, you know, to say I'm how confused I am, why I need to have so many shows, you know, it's crazy. So you're making art to confuse yourself? Uh, that sounds like a great reason to be <laughs> well, <laughs> productive confusion. But uh, but it's also but I it's maybe also, to yeah. refuse to have a clear vision of mm -hmm. myself. Mm -hmm. and it's not a purpose mm -hmm. to confuse myself. That's clearly purpose. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I have to be careful with my language. Mm -hmm. Well, but I'm j okay. Um, one last try. So why this title? Um, why this title? Mm -hmm. I can change your tattoo if you like. <laughs> no. <laughs> no, no. Very no, often no. I show a tattoo I gave him by my assistant or someone helped me and said, how do you think of the tattoo? I said, oh, okay, this can be the title. It's like my name. Why my name like I will? It doesn't, it's, but it happened to be like that. Mm -hmm. Well, because, because of something Dorothea said, right, that you are a producer of meaning. And maybe here, we are here in the business of interpreting and finding, looking for meaning in things. And you can say, well, it just happened, you know, they well, named me so. No, I think but the, maybe there's a I meaning to that. The, the meaningless is, is also a meaning. And, uh, and uh, you know, like uh, Wittgenstein says, since cannot be says clearly, should remain so. Uh, uh, how do you see the unexplained or mm -hmm. something like that? So, very often, especially in some Western uh, aesthetics, everything needs to be explained, and uh, everything serves a reason and a rationality and uh, needs to be explained. So I think Wittgenstein is very much like an <coughs> oriental type of uh, philosopher, you know, he, he clearly says cert certain things uh, should remain uh, unexplained, which I also think so. I think this is one of the things I really like about your art. Um, 
many of the pieces because of just what you're saying. They're they're. I'm totally flattered. They, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Because they they as I was saying, feeling confused expectations, but more than that, the the different layers kind of don't neatly fit together, but point in different directions, open things up. And whether that's confusion or refusing to have a stable vision of oneself or the meaning of the work, I think this is what makes them exciting. Um, one of the things. Um, and I'm, I would love to, I, yeah, I would love to say a word about this one, but I'm also thinking that um, it might be time to switch to the Q&A and we can come back. Um, but I think this, this, this work here is, an, is a case where it, you could say there's a very strong uh, political dimension to this, if you would like, but in the sense that it's entirely in the form of the work, right? Something about labor, about about making handmade things versus the pixelated digital mass production is in there, but not referenced directly. And this is something I like that it's that doesn't have to be read that way. It can be read in a very different way. It's a it's a room full of sunflower seeds, which in itself is an extraordinary thing to see. So, um, all right, so I think we, I think we can um, take the rest. We have half an hour, or maybe a bit more. We can take the rest of the time for questions. What I'd like to um, ask is, of uh, everyone who uh, wants to ask a question, if you could maybe say your name or just just introduce yourself, and also keep the question as as concise as you can, because we want to have time for as many questions as possible. So, and the one question at a time. One question at a time. <laughs> yes. My name is Topper Sherwood. I'm a publisher of Berlin Stories Online. Um, uh, my question is about, uh, I was fascinated to hear you talk about New York in terms of, uh, I would interpret it to say, not very encouraging for work uh, um, in comparison to other places you've lived. And I wanted to ask about Berlin. Um, and its nature and its effect on you, uh, your decision to leave it, and and how it might compare to where you are today, uh, where you live today, and work. Well, to leave it is half a sentence. The reason to leave it is to come back. <laughs> I mean, people always focus, uh, you're, you're really leaving, you really come back? I just, I am here. I'm, they say, are you regretting? Yeah. You know, it's not my problem. It's, it's, as long as I'm outside of China, hmm. I'm a traveler. I'm, a, I'm just a, a, a journey which I cannot even go back to China. Maybe I can late, I can try, but uh, still not yet. I have been outside uh, since uh, eight years now. Yeah, yeah. And uh, I think Berlin. Gradually, I think the city you take gradually, you, you 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 get to know it. My my obstacle is I don't speak German. That's that's uh, it's like a handicap. You know, if you don't speak language, it's really just handicap. You know? And uh, but I I decided <coughs> not my studio in Berlin because I I, I liked it from the first uh, experience. It's a city which I would. Uh, say it's between Beijing and New York. So it's, Beijing has this kind of, you know, ideological uh, uh, time, which Berlin also has this uh, uh, strong ideological struggle. And uh, also New York, uh, I, when I lived in New York in 1980s, it's quite uh, uh, international city and a lot of uh, activities so I that's that's the kind of quality I liked but actually I only stayed in my studio and uh, which is also underground uh, in you know fifth of them. yeah I don't even know how to spell that it's in east part of the Berlin and uh, it's very close to my uh, exhibition uh, so, I don't know if I answered your question. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I'm not sure I'm going to 
I'm gonna have to go by what I see. This, I saw your hands first. So. Thanks. Uh, my name is Andreas. Uh, I'm an uh, alumnus of uh, Bar College, uh, and um, I had the pleasure of uh, uh, going to see you know, sunflower seeds in London. And just want to uh, echo what uh, Jeffrey was saying about just the awesomeness of, uh, of being in that space. Uh, I wanted to ask you about um, the craft uh, of producing uh, these Legos. Um, and the, the meaning of that craft. Uh, firstly, how exactly do you go about it? Uh, is there a plan for, say, the, the Monet, or are you just sitting down with bags of, of Legos and uh, uh, doing it? Or is there a computer program you use? And uh, r related to the meaning, um, uh, what, what, what strikes me about it is that you're, you're taking these obviously unique pieces that, that have become ubiquitous in, in our culture and turning them into these works through Legos that are infinitely reproducible as well, almost like the digital art that, that they um, uh, uh, that they s s seem to allude to. <coughs> With Legos, there, there's a plan, right? So, so you can <coughs> reproduce it if you if you had a plan for for all the pieces. So I just wonder about um, uh, the, this kind of. Um, Play between, on the one hand, unique works of art and, and, and yeah, uh, uh, reproduction. You know, I, I said I, I need a strong reason to convince me to do a work. So first, the work has to relate to my personal history or my I have some kind of intimate feelings to the work. So carefully select the work as uh, as necessary. You know, I have to. You know, it's just like Duchamp once he said that you, the, the ready-made should be limited. You cannot do too many, which I understand that that was the, this, um, this meaning about ready-made because everything's ready-made. So he he did uh, maybe less than thirty, forty works. That's all. He he will not uh, do any more. So my uh, Lego same still can structure. Uh, Anything you want to, but uh, still, my Legos relate to my experience or my my history and or my uh, argument in the way. So that would uh, very uh, be very limited because uh, <coughs> and also it's still even it's. Uh, uh, digital, but still, uh, you know, I have to make all the detailed judgment about the color and about the, you know the to what degree the the image should be presented. You know, I see many many other people uh, doing not so many. A few people did the similar work, but it's not the work. The it's not the same way. So I, every everything, every pixel are are really clearly uh, with clear definition. So it's not uh, uh, just uh, uh, tech technically rendering, but yeah. Yes, but students. Should who is first? Yeah. Who is raising hand back there? Go ahead. Thank you very much, Evo. Um, happy to be not, not from the college. Um, the business lawyer, uh, totally to uh, different background. Nevertheless, very international as well, and a refugee by uh, myself as well in biography. Former East Bloc refugee. Um, but the background, the question that stunned me is this focus and interaction that you seem to embed in all of their works and part. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, this work around the dark hole, the dark spot, uh, even in the Monet, the triangle in the corner there, is there some allusion to this, um, according to the Mendelnoiti uh, spirit as well, right? To, to counteract always and ask oneself as a, uh, as, a, as a spectator as well, what are my dark sides? How do I get along with my dark sides in order to trigger the good ones? And how do I accept my dark sides? Is this part of the game of uh, trying to mirror and embed the, the spectator in your work in a way? Uh, I think you could go piece by piece, even 
the, the sunflower seeds by itself, you could ask yourself, well, it's hundreds of millions or whatever, but each of us is an individual. It represents probably one seed, and nevertheless, each of us can grow and become sunflower in the end, right? So is this perhaps the message of hope and, and simply accept yourself with all your odds that you have and counteract with the good and the evil within oneself and try to trigger the best out of it? Thank you. Can you use one sentence to see what is the question? Contact? Well, the, the question as I understood it is that this is not only your autobiographical moment here, but in a way speaks to the audience exerting them or exhorting them to see their own dark sides and maybe also wow. to see themselves as a seed among the millions. And I, I can find also the question about the, about the sunflower seeds as each as an individual that could potentially grow mm -hmm. these hundred million sunflower seeds. Yeah, I think that was the sense of the question. Well, uh, first, I, if I study the pattern of my behaving, you know, I, I always like a reactionary of my experience. My culture could be culture, could be memory, and a limited uh, experience. But uh, I have a long practice since 70s. I know what uh, porcelain making is about. But I never liked the porcelain. <coughs> Till today, I never really liked the porcelain, but I did a lot. Uh, nobody did more than me because it's not possible. And uh, but uh, very often I, I I did something not trying to accumulating appear to be is like accumulating, but it's rather trying to get rid of it. So. Mm -hmm. And do you see your work as hopeful? I guess that was another I, I think uh, my work is uh, hopeless. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's desperating, but uh, uh, hopeless. That's why I don't like my work. <laughs> it's true. I'm not exaggerating. You, If you go to my studio or my home in Beijing or in, in Berlin or London uh, or in Cambridge, I'm the only artist in this whole world except the most, maybe produce also the most, but you don't see a single work being hanging in my studio. I like empty walls, I like my work to be boxed, uh, you know, never really showing it, it's because I feel shy about doing things like that, so it's true. Mm -hmm. yeah. But it's hard to be honest, because yeah. nobody believes you. I, you know? <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I, you're being patient with all the <coughs> images of your your work here, but but it's like it's it's like something maybe that you've created that's beyond yourself and, is, and, and not sure that you that's can connect to it. It's also true. It, I made sense of which is very much exaggerated. Mm -hmm. It's not uh, exactly myself. I'm just the mm -hmm. trigger. Right. The bullet is mm -hmm. on somebody's body or heart mm -hmm. or something. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Fran here yeah. has been uh, patient. Uh, so my name is Fran. I would like to be an artist someday. And I emailed my art history teacher to see what questions he had, because we talked about you in high school. <laughs> and one that I think was interesting is, do you think that craftsmanship and art will save your people? Do well, I think craftsmanship and art? Will save your people. <coughs> mm, no, I don't think so. I, I, this is a few concepts that can never really uh, organize or con connect the, a structure together. Art is uh, it's very hard to give any defin the, the, the definition. definition. Art, I think, is uh, at the beginning. For me, it's an escape, because uh, you think that can, can protect you from uh, the common assumption. So the art you have, can have your own behaving there. And they, I, for me, it was escape. So, But um, ironically, it become popular. And you have no place to escape anymore. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> but then 
in a sense like creating art is just like writing a diary for you. Like then, then what does it mean for you to be an artist? Like, do you actually define yourself as an artist? I, 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 I don't, I don't care to become an artist or you know. I is honestly I, I. I prefer to take uh, take a selfie, so you know it's it's easy and people are happy and uh, you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I they they, they call me a selfie king or something. I do a lot of selfies. So. Can I press you on this and then we'll open? But in your memoir, which I actually read, and I have to say, not only a great artist but a great writer. I was surprised. Wow. Surprise. <laughs> There's a German translator. No, well, I read English, so I, I cannot relate to the I, I Chinese. Have, I have a good uh, English translator. Yeah, but, um, but there you, you find yourself in prison, and they push you to inter First of all, they ask you who you are, and you say you're an artist. Yeah. And they take an issue with that. I want to make you. it as short and easy, <laughs> but they, they're really serious about it. Yeah. And then they push you to interpret your work, which I thought was a great context to, mm -hmm. to for self-reflection and seeking yourself. But I, I don't want to take Can I maybe just a here. quick comment also. Ron, I'm glad that you raised the issue of craft here, because I think this one of the maybe, I don't know, contradictions that you can say is that I've heard your work described as conceptual art and I see the conceptual aspect, but it's also really a lot fit about making and then this yes. kind of like excessive and intensive I, making. Excessive. So the craft, I agree that the craft element is very prominent. I, 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 I never said it. it's not mm -hmm. important for me. Artist in the original mm -hmm. meaning is a craftsman. Mm -hmm. So craftsman, that means your hands teaches your knowledge. It's not your mm -hmm. knowledge leading to your hand. So, yes, I think uh, it's if there's something charming or something attract me, it's how those things being made. Mm. Mm -hmm. Shall we turn to the yes. Jeff, you need to Jeff, you need to um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, Okay. Well, I don't know. If, I'm going to just go from left to right because please, I don't know who's first. Yes, go yes. ahead. Yes. Me. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Hi, my name's Mike. Uh, Mr. Wei Wei, thank you so much for all your work. It's amazing. And uh, yeah, I always like to see it. I have a question. I have a question for you as an artist. And I've always been curious about this. Um, since you're a very successful artist, obviously, uh, I was wondering, me coming from the USA, and these, these days in the USA, these private art institutions just have astronomically high tuition prices. And my question to you is, do you think, is it worth it for a student, if they want to become a full-time artist as yourself, is it worth it to spend all that money to go to these, one of these private art schools, or is there a more efficient and cheaper alternative in order to become a successful visual artist? <laughs> <laughs> wow. Cost effective, uh, cost effective. Cost effective, right. I, I think uh, it really depends how we how do we understand the words as artist or you know now today it's uh, it's just one type of artist we're talking about it's not really uh, so I was can say pretty successful till about a few weeks ago I learned four of my exhibitions being cancelled so how successful can you be when four of your exhibitions been cancelled in one week? So don't take successful as a something. Uh, do do not have illusions about it. You know, my father was uh, uh, the the best poet in China, but he was punished to to clean the public toilets for many many years. So this. Uh, this mass judgment or about successful is 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 not worth anything, you know. That's how I, I feel. You know. But do you think art could be taught at school? I guess that's part. Of I the think uh, yeah. art can be untold in school. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yes, yes. You you have to think otherwise. Otherwise, uh, uh, 
how can art be produced in school? Uh, knowledge about art has can be taught in school. History can be taught in school, and argument, uh, philosophy, everything. But to art means something has to be unique, unique experience that cannot be told by anybody. Your your. Nobody can help you on that. So uh, maybe I put it a little bit too uh, to exaggerate. But if you want to just get uh, some kind of essential understanding of what art practice is, school is <coughs> a place. Because most people, they, they may, if they don't go to school, they may not, not have uh, enough knowledge. But till you give up all those knowledge, then you may find something. But it's but why we have to talk about those things? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay. Um. Yes. Uh, I can't see. I'll be yeah. back there um, again. Uh, my name's Owen. I'm a first year PCB. I have a question more about activism and art. Um. So. I guess I'm wondering, you make a lot of pieces with very meaningful meanings, whatever, but how do you decide where and when to display it so that it can actually be seen, interpreted, and digested by the people, and kind of have the purpose that you would hope it would? You know, where do you pick, how do you decide, and what makes it actually <coughs> meaningful? You, I, I think you have to, well, there's many things there, you have to be, uh, less calculating, you know, less, you cannot make a lot of, uh, uh, to, to say, reasoning, you know, artists against the reasoning. So if you really want to calculate, you can never really become, a, uh, to have a courage or to, to be yourself. Even just say to be yourself. <coughs> How many times in our life we can see the moment we, you know, to be yourself. So, I my advice is uh, you have to act before you you evaluate the situation. Mm -hmm. Art is about to put yourself in certain kind of danger, and uh, if you don't do that, you still can decorate the room or to to build something beautiful or you know uh, even but. It, you can never be uh, a real artist, but there's very few real artists actually. Uh, I'm not even one. So <laughs> how, how do we tell? <laughs> that's exact. How do you tell a real artist? Real artist means you make mistakes. You accept mistakes, and when you see someone not already not making mistakes, leaving up the, some kind of ex expectation. That's a dead artist, you know. So, art is supposed to bring surprise, surprises. So, um, yes. Uh, go ahead. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you very much for the talk. My name is Shami Feldman, and I'm a curator and a gallerist. And thank you for bringing up the four um, cancel exhibitions because I would love to hear a bit about your thoughts when you talk about the recent exhibition here in Berlin, and when you talk about when you talk very personally as well about how your father has been writing about Christianity. Of course, I read the statements about the cancellation, what, what was written, and the explanations that were given. But as well, of course, he brought questions of anti-Semitism. And I would be interested in, I would be interested if you, if you maybe can give a personal as well, an artistic um, point of view of maybe from your, the time that your father has been writing in China or in New York, in Berlin or in other places about your relation to um, yeah, questions of anti-Semitism, Judaism, or maybe Islam and uh, Islamophobia as well in our times. So what's the question? <laughs> um, the, the question can, can, be, can simply be your personal relation to questions of anti-Semitism, Judaism, Islam and Islamophobia from when, China, when I was born, the year 1957, my father was uh, uh, 
I felt that the, the same as he was being criticized as a anti-revolution, anti-communist, or anti, uh, you know, another anti, something I don't even remember, anti-socialism, you know, three of them. But my father was a poet. He doesn't have any idea to to anti anybody, he just uh, gave out his uh, opinions. Same as me, I about uh, I don't know uh, about ten or twenty days ago, I think at uh, ten o'clock or uh, fifteen minutes, fourteen minutes past ten o'clock before I went to bed, someone asked me a, a simple question on Twitter. They said, "Wait, wait, can you tell me?" why I think the U.S. and uh, Israel have very special relations. And uh, it's very different from the U.S. relation to the West nations. Oh, I think that's a valid question I gave you. You know, my, my, my response, you know, my response is how I look at this sense. So my sentence immediately be picked up as uh, anti-Semitist. I made two points. One is uh, Israel uh, or, or, or the Jewish situation is really created, you know, badly created or, or be messed up by the West, but later being pushed into Arabic world. You know, no Arabic kills these millions of Jewish people, but rather uh, the West. You know, especially Germany made a very big contribution to that, and also many other nations, Poland or Ukraine, and you know. The Russians did that part. Oh uh, yeah, many. Uh, whoever, also mm -hmm. U.S. did it. So yeah, many. You know, even uh, I cannot even think about it. It's just everywhere trying to crash those Jewish people. So one point I made is, uh, you know. Another, I said uh, the Jewish people have a strong presentation or controls the U.S. politics, economy, and the culture sector, which also I think is common, common assumption or common knowledge. But I never really understand this is anti-Semitist. I never heard about what is anti-Semitist. So I have to Google from the mm -hmm. Wikipedia to see, oh, that is anti-Semitist. So I see. I think there's many, many things in in our life or in our political situation. Certain things you cannot even discuss. They don't even allow you to have a different opinions or even wrong ideas. So I made the argument. I said, uh, you know, if you society cannot make cannot allow people to have even wrong ideas, I, I don't think my idea is wrong, but still is arguable, but uh, that is horrible society. It's not mm -hmm. modern society. It's a dark age. Mm -hmm. And uh, of course, they not just canceled my show. Uh, my show is canceled in four different nations. Mm -hmm. But a lot of uh, editors or affairs or and, uh, you know, a lot of institutions, even book fairs and uh, everywhere, they cancel anything which ref reflects different opinions, which I think that is a threat to a modern society. And that's how I feel, you know. I mean, the, we have time for maybe a couple more, and I know Dorothea, you've been waiting a while, and I see Ina back there, so. Hi, I'm Ina, I'm a student at BCB. I wanted to ask you about Students the beautiful yeah. Yeah. and the idea of beauty. Beauty. And I was just curious, yes, what do you think, what role does the beauty play in art for you? In beauty? In art. The beautiful. Oh. I uh, suddenly, uh, the An Andy Warhol's uh, words jumps out. He said, "Every sense beauty," <laughs> which is true. Uh, yeah, it's just uh, how we look at sense. Or <coughs> if if we are very shallow, we would only think one type of thing can be called beauty, 
but often I, I think uh, that only shows ignorance. So that's how I feel. But this is, uh, mm -hmm. yeah, sorry. Um, yeah, this is very much the kind of thing I had in mind when I like briefly referred to the, like this, the, I don't know, say sublimity of this work or this, this the sunflower seeds, that there's, in addition to any other layer of meaning, there's an immediate effect which is extremely powerful and in this case maybe sublime and I think in the case of the Monet, um, beautiful and um, yeah, I don't know. I think I also think that's an interesting question because the beautiful, for me, the beautiful in your work coexists with some very different thing. It's, it's somehow however political the work is. It's uh, and I wouldn't say all of your works are beautiful, but some quite a few are. But I, I, I yeah, I, I think uh, the beauty coexists with the meaning and the functioning. Mm -hmm. The functioning is the meaning. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So that means aesthetic coexists with moral judgment and with philosophy. Mm -hmm. And the, we cannot separate it. That then it will not be will not serve the purpose. So yeah. um Dorothea, you've been waiting a while, I know. Did you want to say something? I was just curious to hear a little bit more about your interest and work in architecture, how this came about and how this collaboration uh -huh. with Herzog uh, Dimoron started and what interests you to work in architecture. Thank you. Uh, my, I never think I will become an architect, but uh, I, I did this uh, around 60 projects and uh, from uh, my personal studio to uh, to national, how do you call this, Bernest or national stadium, I was involved. I become an architect only when I was living in Beijing to, to come back to see my mom. And uh, till one day my mom got very tired, she think, this boy never think, really seems went to United States for 12 years, come back with no American passport, <laughs> doesn't even know dr how to drive a car, and then of course I, I, I just do, I just stay at home, play, play cards with my brother, play poker. <laughs> you know, I, I don't want to get involved with Chinese society because I, I, I just want, you know, nothing to do with it. So I start to go to antique market to search him for the old objects. <coughs> and one day my mom said, maybe you should move out because he, she thinks I'm such a uh, uh, failure. <laughs> you know, really, she, she, she really thinks so. And uh, she changed her mind till I get arrested <laughs> because she thinks this guy must be very powerful, the state would uh, make him disappear. But it's all wrong judgment, and uh, so I, I realize I, I have no place to go. I don't want to, to rent an apartment. I said, okay, maybe I go to the village. I rent a piece of land. I can build my studio. And the all the village around Beijing, they want to sell their land. They wanted to rent their land because they cannot produce uh, uh, to to make a living. So they said it's not le it's not legal, but uh, we we will not stop you if you build your studio. You can call it uh, some kind of agriculture research center or something. <laughs> That's why I did my software things. <laughs> and so I started build my studio, and uh, immediately my studio being recognized as one of the best or most interesting uh, architecture work in Beijing. So that time, all the architecture professional books published my studio. And the uh, first show I come to Germany is invited by Adidas, 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 mm -hmm. Adidas. You know, Adidas the architecture com uh, gallery. I showed my work. So that time I was architect, so, you know, so which is okay. But, uh, <laughs> I don't like to be called as architects anyway. 
but I know how to build because I live in very difficult situation. So I have to have some surviving ideas. With my father, when I was like ten years old, and uh, but I had one book. It's Wittgenstein's uh, how he how he uh, built his uh, sister's uh, house. I love the book, but I never really think you know I love the book because I like like this uh, philosopher, you know. But uh, I never think I will become an <coughs> architect. I think we have time for one more question, and maybe Ava, you have something to say at the end. But maybe but these two, we can take them together. Is that okay? Okay. Yeah. That there's, okay. Go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. Then. Yeah. yeah. Okay. A little louder. We can't oh, hear. I know it says that um, uh, all of your art pieces on design yourself exhibition are based on another art pieces. Uh, except for one, uh, the Nord Stream. Now I wanted to ask why did you decide to include this on the exhibition and what meaning it has Nord Stream? Why did you include mm -hmm. that? Is yeah. it, because oh, it's a yeah, one yeah, off okay, in okay. that. Yeah. I have a photograph of it really paid attention to the work. Mm -hmm. <coughs> this one? Yeah. Well, this work is in front of uh, another work, uh, Jackson Pollock's. Uh, mm -hmm. How do you call that? Strip painting. Dripping painting. Mm -hmm. So yeah. Jack Pollock's work yeah. has been uh, a s starting of <coughs> really American art, you know, not on the s how do you say uh, vertical, but on the ground and uh, do that, the dripping. But uh, the Lego really have the complete different meaning because drinking is the action of uh, sequence but Lego is really one pixel has nothing to do with another it's evenly flat and evenly. same same quality in every look uh, part so I think it's very ironic do I have this mm -hmm. but in our time the real leaking or drinking is this uh, image. So I think it's nice to to say that has abstract quality but it really can be threatened to to our life as a World War III because you cannot just uh, damage a civil elements in, in by, by the war definition you cannot do that. It's, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's a is a violation to even destroy the pipe like that, or so I think. Uh, it's the beauty, it's the potential danger coexists. So I think it's the interesting image. Can I offer another interpretation? Yes. <laughs> um, well, oh. I think your exhibit is a critique of the West. You know, it's a celebration uh, of Western art, but it's yeah. also a critique of the West. I won't go into it, but the, the juxtaposition of Pollock and this, we, we spent some time in front of the Pollock. We had a very interesting <coughs> discussion about the irony of, uh, of putting Pollock into Lego um, in exactly destroying the very freedom that Pollock's uh, art epitomizes. But Pollock is also, for me at least, or maybe not only for me, a kind of symbol of liberalism, of American liberalism, a kind of control. Not a liberalism, but a drunkism. Uh, well, <laughs> <laughs> you use uh, words, but it's really, you know, it's a, your, When I your, said a critique your, of, of your, Western art, you're too I liberal to describe our. <laughs> That's well, what's uh, what, I would, what, I would, my, what was my curated chaos, or a controlled, <laughs> controlled, uh, controlled chaos, curated chaos, you said. Yeah, 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 or some kind of spontaneous order. Yeah, I was thinking if Hayek needed a, 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 an image, Pollock would be perfect, right? There was a kind, of, but here you, there is nothing, neither spontaneity nor maybe chaos, all right. But, but I was thinking, okay, Pollock then, if we can think of Pollock as a liberalism, as the high time of American freedom, and then vis-a-vis -vis this, this whirlpool, what you say, the kind of 
threatening World War III that is, that, that is upon us, right? It seemed to me, for me at least, that was a kind of comment on where we are today with this liberal idea. I agree. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Maybe the last word. Yes. Um, thank you for coming to our space and having this dialogue with us. Um, my question is about, it feels to me, or I interpret that there is a, a fluidity um, with memory or with moments that you find meaning in. And are there things that you do to maintain this connection to that? And if so, would you speak to it a little bit or share some of that of that practice? Because it's counterintuitive to the way that we are taught to think in this world right now. Well, it's, it's interesting. <coughs> I think uh, as, as a life or as an individual, we all have been given equally uh, time and uh, and we are equipped with certain meaning beyond our understanding so that's why I I always go back to what uh, seemingly I already have experience or memory but uh, you know my memory doesn't really serve me very well but still uh, trying to reinterpret it's a, a still worse effort than just you know because it's uh, that that's part of your life so that's how I I, I couldn't find a better uh, way actually I'm lacking of a resource but still I already willingly or not I already have so much and uh, yeah. That's a good note to end on. Maybe I can I can just add. I, I wanted to say more about this, but I won't. But the the end of your memoir, the last chapter, is said, is called "Living the Best Life We Can," and it seems to me that that's what you're trying in your individual capacity. But this is also what your art is calling us to do, collectively, or maybe each of us individually. And that seems to me a good call. Yeah, that can be easily misinterpreted uh, because of what is the best life? How do we, how do we, uh, how do we give a, a judgment about that? So. Or how do we know what we can? It's true. Yeah. These are the kind of things we discuss in this college <laughs> without resolving. <laughs> Every day, and you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.